Well, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about how you guys are going to be dealing with the world once you uh, get out of UBC and, and practice as an engineer in some capacity. In, in the mid-1980s, you know, computer science wasn't a big deal. It was some esoteric, you know, people who work in the back room and do punch cards and so on. It's not very glamorous. At that point, if you're an engineer, you go, you walk along main wall and you see the big turbines turning and so on. You can see Simi, the, the mechanical building, right on main mall. I don't know if you can still see it now. But, you know, mechanical engineering did a wonderful job in the promotion. They put big windows there and they put the labs right in front there. So everybody who walked by, you can see the turbines turning and engineers in there, you know, doing things. Wow, this is, this is the life you want. Not some computer stuff that you know you have nothing to know about. But when you work, it's a very different world. You go in something like that, you see the military guys and the Coast Guard and so on using something like that, saving people's lives, it's because of information. Then you go, wow, I am missing something there. The world has changed. So don't be surprised if in the future you do something quite different. Because that's probably what you're going to be doing. It's something quite different. But what you're learning now is going to be the foundation of how you build new knowledge and new skills. So don't overlook what you're doing now. My third job, I decided to come back to my hometown, Vancouver here, and uh, I work for a company called MDA, McDonald Detweiler Associate. And these are the guys who put the uh, space, um, not the space station, but the uh, robot arm into space shuttles and all that. So I was doing a little bit of that. Uh, Earth observation using uh, the latest in laser technology to, to scan the Earth, to build stereoscopic images and so on for different countries. So more data processing, more computer science. That's my evolution of my career for the first 10 years. And then after 10 years, I was a senior engineer, and I quit. That was a hard decision. You know, my parents and everybody were saying that, you know, Patrick, you're such, a, such an idiot. You got, you got a senior engineering position, you have 10 years solid experience. You, you got your life, you know, right in front of you, all, all planned. You know, you can work till retirement, and you'll be all set. I go exactly, and that's why I want to change, because I don't want that. That's not what I want. So I strike out on my own. As you can see, I used to slide off somebody dirt bike. It's, uh, it's, it's rough, you know, it's not, it's not on, the, on the paved highway. It's rough and tumble. You want to start out as an entrepreneur, uh, well, you become an entrepreneur. So the next big thing, what was my next big thing after 10 years? That was about 20 years ago. And I decided that, well, you know, in the 10 years I've been working, I see people getting fired. I see people getting promoted quickly. And I go, why? Those are both engineers or computer science or whatever, technical people, competent technical people. And yet one would be let go. The other one would rise through the ranks quickly. And it turns out to be one thing, and that's how you communicate and your attitude towards your work. So it is all in your head. Your success and your failure is going to be all in your head. What you're learning now is, like I said, the foundation. Without that, you wouldn't even be able to get into the door of what you want to do. But that's a given. Like your associate dean, Dr. Croft was saying that that's personal hygiene. It's a must. Without this, you won't go anywhere. But is it enough? No, it's not enough. Corporate people skills. You'd be surprised how inadequate a lot of us are, especially in the technical field, uh, us uh, gearheads. Do you still call them gearheads? No, I guess not. In my days, we call them gearheads. Um, engineers. We are probably the worst off bunch of all professionals because we don't get that kind of training. You guys have a lot on your plate. Your coming up year, third year is going to be the big one if 
the curriculum is about the same as when I was here. Um, technical stuff, important technical stuff, but if you are not aware of something like this, you will be shortchanging yourself into a lot of opportunities that you miss. You don't know what you don't know. That's the problem is, do you know how much of your shirt sleeve is supposed to stick out from your, from your jacket? If you're, if you're a lady, how high should your high heel be? What kind of high heel shoes should you wear? Pumps? Uh, what's the other ones? Uh, slings? Uh, open toes? How do you wear? How long should your skirt be? Or should you, wear, should you not wear skirt but pants? You think those are not important? That can make or kill your career on top of your technical skills. So my talk today is uh, going to be very brief because I only get a few minutes here. I'm going to talk about what you're going to run into. It's going to be between countries. You're going to deal with other countries, no doubt. You work for a company now, we are all multinationals. We're all over the map. That's how you do business nowadays. There's no single company who wants to survive in this world would be saying, I'm Canadian and I only deal with Canadian stuff or Canadian customers. They can do that, but they won't last very long. Second is engineers and others. How do you deal with other culture? And I'm talking about somebody from uh, Africa or, or wherever. We're talking about people who speak English, but they are not engineers. That's a different culture, believe it or not. And some of the solutions, what you can do, and so on. So what is intercultural communication? What does it really mean? Between countries? Sure. You can have somebody maybe from Asia talking to somebody from Europe. That's going to be a problem, as it's quite obvious. Different culture. But the other one is the engineers to others. The engineer fellow over here talking to a military guy. How are you going to talk to him? He doesn't understand differential equations. He doesn't care. He doesn't understand finite element analysis and stress analysis and all that. He just wants to make sure his tank is going to work and you're gonna to talk to him in his language. Otherwise, what would happen? You would seem like an engineering guy who is snobbish, who is just out of this world. Yeah, he's very technically competent, but I don't know how to talk to him. I hear that a lot. And how do you talk to a grown PNG to say, John, you gotta work on your communication skill. And John will say, what do you mean, Patrick? You know, I speak English better than you. And I go, yeah, you do, but you still can't communicate. And this guy is just going to not like me very much, John, because he just didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, you got to have some training. You know, it, it takes a little while for people to sink in that communication is not just about speaking something exactly the way it is. You tell them exactly the way it is, they're not going to understand very well. But if you just say, well, you know, the, the blue machine over there, it, it's, it's busted. Don't worry, I'll fix it. That's all you need to say. Instead of giving them all the details about, well, we should be like this and like that and so on, they don't care about your details. That's your job, okay? Talk to them at their level. It's very hard. I still make the mistakes at, in my house. And um, my wife and I will go, go Patrick, you're, you're so technical. How come you're so technical? And I go, Mm, what, what do you mean I'm so technical? I'm, 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 just, I'm just me. It's already watered down. You know, you really want to get technical? <laughs> um, it, it doesn't work with most people, okay? We're, we're a very special bunch. And uh, you want people to like engineers, you got to be likable. This is the big one. Number one and number two combined. So it's like wave, you got super positioning, one wave over another and you got a big hump there and, and you got a big problem here. You got a CEO from India. You, the Canadian engineer in the middle there, and somebody from Africa, she's the marketing person. 
Now, are we talking about the same company? If it is, you as an engineer may have a chance of succeeding because uh, even if you screw up a little bit, people forgive you. Wow, we are the same company and so on. What if the CEO is a buyer? What if the lady here from Africa, Kenya, is, uh, is a seller? There are 50 million cell phone users now in mid-Africa. You think you can tap into that market? Sure you can. So within one company, you're maybe OK. But if you're dealing with the customers, you will have to really work on your communication skills. So what are companies like today instead of the past? More multi-ethnic, more globalized. Three buyouts in five years. One company I came across, the person, the engineer was sitting at the same desk. Same cubicle, same O, same O. But the name plate of his name was changed three times in five years. But one good thing about having a lot of uh, tentacles in different countries is you tend to have friends in all the different places. US, Norway, Denmark, Hong Kong, Japan, China, Malaysia, Singapore, Chile, Netherlands, Kenya, Nigeria. You can call people over there. Hey, Larry, this is Patrick here. Can I come and stay at your house? Issue number one, some of the problems. What is this? Center of the universe. We all think that we are the center. UBC, mechanical engineering, second year. We all think that other people should think like us. They don't. We reject foreign cultures. I'm not just talking about people from China or somewhere. We reject other people. Oh, those are the commerce guys. Well, that's the reason why they're in commerce because they can't hack calculus. That's what probably some of you would think. Don't think like that. Someday they could be your boss. Why is it important? I don't want to change. I hear that all the time. We're lucky in Vancouver. You, you, you grow up in a, in a fairly multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, community here. So by, just by default, you already have friends who are maybe from China, from India, from Chile, and so on, sitting right next to you. And uh, use it well. Don't discard that. Okay? That is part of your university experience. Moral of the story, you need to change not the other countries. You know, in China, 1.3 billion people, they're not going to change for you. That's a lot of inertia there. You can't push that, okay? <laughs> Example, time zone. I was working in uh, the high-tech area in California, and we see that all the time. Manager said, well, you know, let's meet at 12 o'clock noon, California time. It's uh, 4 o'clock in the morning in Mumbai. And those poor engineers over there, they have to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning every time. California wants to have a meeting. How do you think they feel? They're not going to like it. So eventually, we say, no, 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 that's not the right way. We've got to show respect. Just because they are the outsourcee and we're the outsourcer, doesn't mean that you know, they don't have feelings. You've got to think about something like that. Nothing technical there, okay? So, but you gotta have the sensitivity to think about that. That sometime, you wanna get up at four o'clock, so people in Mumbai will be getting up at 12 noon to have a teleconferencing with you. Uh, oh, don't worry, it's not gonna get any worse. Uh, let the poor man and poor woman speak, okay? Um, a lot of time, we here in North America, we tend to do more speaking than listening. I know I fall into that a lot, and that becomes a big issue. 
one of the time I was in Japan, and uh, the reason why I was there was because they want to have FaceTime. They want to see me. They don't, they don't just want an email saying this and that. And all I said was, um, well, you know, with all due respect, let them speak. Let your people speak. They have a culture of top-down. Japan is a very engineering-oriented group. And they would go, well, they listen to the fatherly figure on top. But unfortunately, most of the people with ideas are, are young people, like yourself. Those are the young engineers sitting in the room. They are all very compliant, very, very quiet. They have great ideas, but they, they don't, they're not heard. So my job as a corporate consultant would be, with all due respect, let the people speak. And then I be quiet myself and let the rest take over. What are these women doing? They are probably the, some of the best engineers if they ever decide to be engineers. Because you know, you know what? This woman is pouring her heart out. And the other two, they're all years. They're all listening there, right? Listen, 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 okay? And you should also pour your heart. You know, you really believe in certain things. Well, instead of building a power plant over by, over here, we should build it over here. Let people know. That's where you add value. Number two, we are egotistical. Yes, we are. We believe we are the superhero. We are going to drop in, parachute in, and save the day. Those days are long gone. Okay? And uh, you will be working in a team. And if anything that is going to be accomplished by you is a team effort. Don't forget, it's a team effort. No voicemail. There are still people who don't use voicemail. And uh, because they, they're too busy, they think they are above that, and so on. That's not being considerate. I go in there and tell corporate people, CEOs, and so on, you should get a voicemail. There are people who don't use it. And so instead of thinking of themselves, say, well, I don't have time, you should think about the caller. The caller needs to take time to talk to you. So let him communicate with you in that. So, fashionably late for meetings. In some culture, you are the big shot CEO, the guy with the investment. You go into the meeting late to show that you, know, you are the important one. In some culture, that is the case. Perhaps not here in the West. We look at our time as you know, you want, you want to be punctual. But in some culture, that's what they are. And if you take offense, you be shortchanging yourself. They are relational-based people. They are not transactional-based people like us. We deal with something, finish, do something else. Boop, 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 boop. No. They look at things as a very network kind of a relationship. It's long-term. So I went to... Some countries, they say, oh, well, Patrick, oh, he's from Canada. Oh, well, wait. So I wait. It could be half an hour. Do I complain? No. Do I look at my watch? No. Because that's a sign of disrespect in their, in their mind. You want to sit there and not using your phone, not doing anything, but just sit there and just look around, maybe talk to the secretary. She could be your key to getting what you want. The real power is not with the CEO, it's with his secretary. Because she or he is the one arrange all the meetings for the CEO. If you um, make her dislike you, you'll finish. Answer that call while she waits. That's a no-no, okay? You want to make sure that you're talking to the person in front of you not somebody on the phone. We are individualistic. A lot of big words today. Um, no formulas. Coffee mugs, okay? What's wrong with coffee mugs? Nothing, but 
after 20 years, after 10 years of my career, we started a company, and this is one of my people. We went to Japan, and this guy's Canadian, and what's wrong with this picture? In the land of the tea, what is he doing? He has his own mug, just like you guys have. You know, some of you have the mugs and so on, Starbucks, whatever. He brought his own stuff. We walked into NEC, Nippon Electronic Corporation. You know, their, their head office is like a space shuttle. Big black room, right in the middle there. You know, three properly dressed receptionists waiting there. What is the first thing they ask you? Would you like something to drink? That's the first thing they ask you. Here in, in the West, you know, you go to a company, oh, who would you like to see? Oh, why don't you wait for a few minutes? Sometimes they may ask you what you want to drink, but most of the time they don't because they see you already have a mug in there. And my friend Larry here is the same way. He brought his own drink everywhere. And everywhere he goes, people ask, would you like something to drink? And uh, he said, no, I'm fine. It's not bad, but some people take an offense. They don't know your culture. They think that, well, their tea is not good enough. So be very, very careful. Some culture prefer individual activities. Some prefer group activities. English versus French. I was working in Montreal. At CAE, I was invited to uh, expo, baseball games, and so on in a group, 20 people. You know, their girlfriends and all that, you know, we all go. I was working in California. Nobody ever asked me that because they figured that you are an individual, you can do whatever you want. Why, why would you want to hang in a big group? We all have different hobbies and, and likes. So those are different. Issue number two, this is the big one. Engineers and others. Why would North American culture fail engineers and in turn fail themselves? You guys are going to be the keeper of the profession. And this is an issue that's going to affect your livelihood and your pocketbook in a big way. Two words, geek squad. You guys know what geek squad is? I think they are, uh, they are some kind of uh, computer repair and diagnostic uh, with uh, Best Buy, something like that, yeah? Uh, Future Shop, yeah. So now, don't get me wrong, geek squad is a very, very good name. It plays on a lot of the nuances of our culture, right? But what's wrong with the word geek squad? Fewer engineers make it to the CEO position in North America than other professions. If you're a bean counter, you may have more chance of becoming CEO than, than an engineer. That's unfortunate. And you guys are going to go out there and change that. The reason being is geek squad. What's, what does it imply? You know, there's, there's, it's just not a very good term to describe engineers and technical people. It's... Um, self-deprecating in, in many ways. So be very, very careful of how you present your image out there. You never hear people call doctors or lawyers geeks. How many times do you think people get called geek if you're, if you're good in computers or good in math or science or engineering? Why is it so unfair? Don't, don't take it lying down. It's your livelihood there. Salaries of engineers are falling behind doctors and lawyers. It didn't used to be like that because engineers were well respected. But over the years, something happened there. What is the engineering culture? I don't want to play politics at work. I just want to do the technical stuff. I hear that over and over and over again with absolutely brilliant engineers. And uh, they turn out to shortchange themselves when they think like that. Don't think like that. Politics is not a dirty word. We think of ourselves as the smart one. Yes, you are. You're UBC engineers. You know, it's a given. You're all smart. 
you don't have to go and prove it over and over again. Okay? You don't. So what do engineers need to change all that? Lead from their position, not yours. Like I said, you know, if a plumber is talking to you, well, you know, those things over there is not working. Well, yeah, you figure it out. You don't have to tell them that there's cavitation and all that. It's just not needed. Okay? Losing your audience to show your brilliance is not it. It's not a show of force. Must change to one of being approachable. You go, oh my gosh, you know, how, 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 how do you mean by approachable? Yeah, I'm approachable. You know, I open my door, everybody can come in and so on. <coughs> only a one way of speaking is not it. If you only speak in terms of technology, that may not do it. In my email nowadays, I have two sections. One section is just the gist of it, you know what you need to do and so on for everybody. Marketing people, graphics, uh, computer, uh, agents, even customers and so on. And then I put in a detail section. And those are for people who need to know the details. Well, you know, we want to really program your computer so that you know, more than one people accessing it, concurrency, so on and so forth. Make it separate. So people who want to read something like that, they can, but not everybody. Ignoring office politics. Office politics is culture. Some people play politics in your mind, but that's their culture. Get used to it. Don't deny it. Don't ignore it. Gift giving, is that sucking up? No. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of respect that you appreciate what they're doing. You know, they're the CEO. They fought hard in their career to become the CEO. They have gone through things that you could never imagine. Being sued, for example, and winning or losing. Those are the stuff that we technical people don't appreciate, and we should. Dressing as you please, definitely not it. I hear that all the time. Company put in a dress code, you have to wear a tie. What do brilliant engineers do? They wear a tie that looks like a fish as a sign of protest. <laughs> That's bad attitude. You know, you could be the most brilliant engineers, but you're going to be the one who's going to be let go because you don't, you don't understand the company culture that they want. Okay? Play their game, not play your game. In other words, you want to work on your image. Engineers have a Fairly, fairly poor image. I walk down Main Mall, you see what all the people from business are doing? They walk out, they all dress like me. Why? Because they deal with customers, they deal with the world. You want to deal with the world, you got to let the world accept you. And dressing is not what you please yourself, it's a sign of respect of others. Example, University of California, where I also went to school. We coach a team or a few teams into how to pitch their ideas to venture capitalists. They're just like you, second, third year, maybe fourth year. And they were building some gizmos and so on, and, and uh, people come in. What is, what is so spectacular with this team? Look at the way how they dress. Look at the way how they stand. Look at their attitude. They are a team. They are unified. You need coaching in that. Okay? It doesn't come naturally. Even deep down, you know your buddies and you're all working there. If you don't behave in certain ways, how do people know that you're really behind each other? They don't know. If you're a lady, you don't have to dress in a suit. You can be looking young, dynamic, energetic, full of ideas, and yet remain professionals. Okay? And uh, low-cut dress, don't cut it. 
Look at this. How do you go to interviews? How do you talk to people? Doesn't he look like a million bucks? Example number two. Example number three. All different ethnic backgrounds, diverse. You can all do it. Now, what is this? This team we didn't coach. What's the problem here? Now, I, I couldn't remember what they were building, but you, know, you need to tuck your shirt in. You need to be able to show that you mean business. Okay? If your venture capitalists want to bring you to show you to some bankers, you dress like that, they're going to throw you out. They don't think you're serious. You're just high school kids. Okay? Case number two. Well, this guy's wearing a pretty nice shirt, like mine, but he got to tuck it in. That's a standard code, okay? You're dealing with baby boomers like myself. We're not used to having people having their shirts out. It's just not in our culture. And with the lady there, the jacket is a little bit too small. She needs to work on that. Okay, last part, latest report on some of the soft skills research. And this was done over a 20-year period by Carnegie Institute, Stanford, and Harvard. A joint 20 years long term, many, many people involved. And this is their finding. 85% of your success in your career is going to be based on your soft skills, what I've been talking about. So they were saying that if you spend $100,000 on your hard skills to gain 15% of your success. How much time, effort, and money should you spend on working on your soft skills? That should be the major part of your training. So this is something important, your mechanical engineering program, but you have a long, long way to become truly successful. Okay. And it's going to be fun. It's not going to be hard. It's going to be fun. It takes the attitude. If you can do calculus, I think in the second year, third year, or first year, you can do soft skills. It's, it's not rocket science. Believe me, it's not. So why is it important? OK, income. Uh, very simple graph because I use this for non-technical people as well. When you're 30, all the way when you're 60, in terms of age, your income rises, okay? Somebody with soft skill training, the research was, uh, was done, starting at age 30, when, when they got training in a company and so on, this is what they make when they, when they hit 60. So there's a discrepancy there. And if you start earlier, when you're 20, like where you are right now, you start off, when you're 30, you start off even higher already. Doesn't matter what you do. This is, this is all conglomerate uh, statistics. So it's on average. And so you can see, yeah, you'll be able to find a job. You'll be able to do quite well. But if you have that kind, you go to the next level of accomplishment. And my talk is done. I have a lot more to say about this. So if you want, I'm on Google+. Plus. You can look for my name, Patrick Chun. I'm with a company called Modestum in that. And uh, regularly, we have seminars for technical people at BCIT and, and so on. And uh, I don't want to preclude you. So there could be something that you can gain and I think this is the right age where you want to get involved in something like this so that um, you are aware what you need to achieve in terms of becoming a professional. That's part of your professional development on top of your current technical development there. Okay, thank you very much.